Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another broadcast of We're Talking Books, a weekly production of Bridge Logos Foundation in Alachua, Florida. My name is Lloyd Hildebrand, and I am the CEO and publisher here at Bridge Logos. It's kind of a rainy, cloudy, dark day here in northern Florida, but uh, I know that our program can bring some sunshine into everyone's souls today. Each week on our show, we interview authors of our books, and we give books away as well. In fact, today, we will be happy to give away free books, uh, which will be the books that our guest has written, uh, to our first five callers. So get a pen and paper handy, and uh, I'll give you the phone number here in just a moment. Uh, We hope you will give us a call. By so doing, you will be able to ask questions of our guest or make any comments that you may have. The phone number you should call is 646-378-0089. Let me repeat that. 646-378-0089. And please give us a call during this half hour as we meet together with our guest. It is my privilege and honor to introduce him to you now. Mr. Holland Davis is the author of our new book, Let It Rise, a Manual for Worship. Holland is a guest speaker, university lecturer, and worship leader at various conferences and churches across America. He has written many popular worship songs, including Let It Rise, for which he received ASCAP's Most Played Christian Song of the Year Award for 2006. Holland resides in San Juan Capistrano, California, where he serves as an assistant pastor of Ocean Hills Church. He and his wife, Roxy, have two sons, Austin and Chase, and one daughter, Madison. Welcome to We're Talking Books, Holland. How are you today? I'm doing very well, and um, thank you for having me as part of your show here today. You're very welcome. Um, I assume that I'm talking to you. You are in Southern California as we speak. I am, and um, and, and we're just it's just, uh, I don't want to tell you how incredible the day is, because I want to make you feel bad, but it's just uh, <laughs> its just another beautiful day in Southern California. It always seems to be, that's for sure. And uh, I wanted to just uh, talk to you for a moment here about your book, which is Let It Rise. It's a trade size paperback that retails at only thirteen ninety nine. On the front cover of your book, and there's an epigraph at the beginning of the book as well, in which you quote C.S. Lewis, who wrote, It is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to men. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said the Father is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. Holland, as a well-known worship leader, what is your definition of true spiritual worship well one of my favorite definitions from worship for worship came from a pastor friend of mine by the name of ken blue and he described worship like this he said that worship was loving each other in god's presence and loving god in each other's presence and for me that has just always captured what happens when we gather together as a community and we really live out a life of worship when we really allow um, the love that we have for God to be um, not only communicated to him through song, but communicated to uh, to each other through acts of love. You know, as we, out of our love for God, begin to care for one another, uh, display uh, forgiveness towards other each other, and all those different things that are really an overflow of our love for God, that is really an act of worship. And so um, I just have always thought that that kind of encapsulates uh, worship for me. Oh, that's that's an outstanding answer. I'd never, 
uh, considered it that way. It's in a way, it's sort of a, a fulfillment of the supreme commandment, isn't it, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Really, it really is. And you know, the thing is, is that so often um, when you talk about the topic of worship, folks will focus on the congregational setting. Um, in fact, we even refer to our uh, church services as as worship services. Um, but really, worship is a much bigger topic. It really covers all of life. And um, but as it applies to the congregational setting, you know how I kind of refer or explain what occurs in that setting is it's really when the when the congregation gathers together, and in a sense, the worship songs, the songs that we sing, are really uh, our sung prayers. It's when we, as a community, pray our prayers to God through song. And so that's kind of my hermeneutical key as I go in and and talk about um, what worship is in the congregational setting, and really what how we as worship leaders function. You know, we're not just you know up there playing songs, but we're really leading the people in sung prayer. Yes, um, Holland, would you say that your book is written primarily for worship leaders, or is it a book that's written for everyone? Well, what's interesting is. Um, you know, of course, a lot of the material that came from it was derived from over 15 years of teaching at conferences and universities and things like that. And and so a lot of these topics were specifically focused towards those that were pursuing the vocation of leading worship. But what I found is um, is that you know we have lots of of folks here at the church that have, have uh, now have the book. And they're really looking at it, and they're learning. Wow, this is really what worship is, you know. Like, because there's a little section in the very beginning where we do just a like a thumbnail sketch of a theology for worship, and then we talk about a thumbnail sketch of the theology of what a worship leader is. And so, um, everybody really can gather something out of it, even if you're just a leader in a church. Um, there's leadership principles that we lay out that really go across the board to any ministry that you're involved in. What uh, particularly remarkable occurrences come to your mind uh, when you think about things that have happened when you've been leading worship? I'll bet uh, there have been some surprising things, haven't there? Oh, there's there's been all kinds of um, stories uh, that I could tell. I mean, um, you know, being in a kind of a public position, um, you know, as a worship leader, you know, you're on platform. And uh, I remember folks coming up to me and saying, you know, we always we always love to come and and uh, and to hear the you know what you're doing and and the songs you're writing and all that sort of stuff, you know, in your worship leading because it's almost like you journal your life, you know, in front of us, you know, every week, hmm. so we can always see what God is doing in you. Um, but there's, um, in fact, one, one person said to me, you know, we know why you're su- such a great worship leader. And I said, why? And he goes, because your life is always in crisis. So you just need Jesus more than, you know, than, than the normal person does, you know. <laughs> and um, wow. and sometimes it does feel like that. You know, you find yourself where you're constantly, you know, before the Lord, crying out to him. And, uh, and so you have that communion, that fellowship with him. And um, but there's a few stories that kind of um, pop in the mind. One was uh, really the the story behind uh, the song "Let It Rise," which I kind of you know write it out in detail in the book, and and that was really you know we were you know leading worship at um, at a small Bible study in uh, Pacific Beach, and this Bible study for this church, Calvary Chapel of Pacific Beach, you know actually took place in a coffee shop right along the beach so you can imagine what the traffic would be like you know people walking in and out of this place and and buying food and drinks and and noise and all this sort of thing and so every wednesday night they would have uh, a midweek study in there so we went into this uh, coffee shop and my regular drummer you know could not make it so um you know, my bass player said, "Hey, I've got this drummer. He's awesome. He's amazing. You know, he, you know, let's bring him, and and he'd be perfect." So I said, "Okay," 
And we went to do the sound check, and as we're going through the songs, you know, it was like this drummer didn't know any of the songs. And and not only that, but his his timing was off. He was just not good. And it was at that moment I realized that all bass players are liars. Um, <laughs> that this guy basically, you know, he 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 didn't know what good was. And so, um, and I, I I say that facetiously. He's a great he's a great talent and musician, but. You know, at that time, I was I was really frustrated, and so we went for prayer. And as we're praying, you know, I'm, I'm assessing the situation, and and I'm thinking, you know, the band doesn't know the songs; it's not coming together. the the um, The place is is just filled with activity. There's you know all this distraction, and it was hardly an environment for worship to happen in. And um, as I was uh, praying before this uh, before we started i started strumming these chords that uh, became the, the chords to let it rise and and in my heart is this prayer lord if you don't crash through all of this if your glory doesn't rise if your presence doesn't rise up in this place um it's just going to be a disaster it's just not going to happen you know worship you know songs praise let just let it break out let it rise in this place and so this this is the prayer that's going on in my mind and um so we go out and it's time to start and I turn to the band and in my mind I'm thinking you know you don't know any of the other songs so what's one other song you know to add to the mix and I said play these three chords and got the band playing the three chords and I turned around and just out came let it rise the way we sing it today is how it came out the very first time just a total gift from the Lord. And as we began to sing that song, it was almost like a hush fell on the room. And there was this stillness that came, and people stopped talking. They put their drinks down. They put their food down. And they stopped moving about, and they lifted their hands, and they began to worship the Lord. And they began to sing this song as if they had sung it their whole life. It was just really one of those um, precious moments um, that uh, that I, I'll never forget as a worship leader. And then all of a sudden it was like the drummer got healed of, of bad timing and everything else. <laughs> and the whole evening just just flowed. Just It was just a powerful time of worship. Unlike, you know, any I've, I've – very few situations have I experienced like that. Oh, that is absolutely tremendous. That's the kind of story that gives people uh, – goose pimples and chills and thrills. Uh, I wish I had been there that evening. That must have been some experience indeed. Um, it, do, you, do you feel it is possible uh, for a, a person, any person really, to be in a worshipful setting such as the one you've just described and not be changed by it? Well, we saw that with Jesus. Yeah. Um, you know, you would think that to be in the presence of Jesus, and we we preach this from our pulpits, you know, that, man, all you need to do is be in the presence of Jesus and your life will be transformed. And yet Jesus was walking amongst, you know, this this nation of Israel in biblical times, and, and he was even walking amongst 12 of his closest, you know, uh, partners in ministry, you know, the disciples, people that spent all this time with them, and they didn't even get it sometimes. You know, they missed the opportunities. They missed the boat. And um, and so I think it is possible for people to come into a setting and uh, and really miss what God has for them. Because a lot of times it really has to do with our choice, our decision to open our eyes, to allow ourselves to see, to to position ourselves in a place where uh, where God can truly, um, you know, truly work in our lives. You know, Colossians 2, 6, and 7 talks about being rooted and built up in, in Christ. And what's interesting about that word rooted is that it, it literally means that, that we are rooted. In other words, we're not the ones that root ourselves, but it's something that's done to us, that Jesus literally roots us in himself and so our role is to allow ourselves to be rooted that's what we're to do we're, we're to position ourselves so that so that jesus can work in our lives and so often i see it happen in the 
place of worship where, where people will come in and they will not position themselves in a place to hear God or worship God or or surrender to God or allow God to have any input into their lives. It's almost as if they come in and and you all and and you have to take them through this process to bring them to a place where they say, "Okay, I do want to hear from God." Mm-hmm. And um, and so that's why I'm saying, you know, as a prayer, you know, I, I see myself more as a prayer leader than a a music leader. I, I see what I do m- mostly not as a musical function, but as a as a leadership function, as a pastoral function, to bring people from this place of scatteredness into this. Uh, through prayer, you know, to 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 really allow what's in their hearts to come out to God, and so oftentimes I'll hear that it's like, man, the, that prayer you said or that song you sang said what I wanted to say, but I didn't know how to say it, and it allowed me to kind of turn the corner and and allow myself to be open to whatever the Lord wanted to do in my life. Wow, that is quite powerful, you know. Uh, Worship uh, leads us into the presence of God, uh, and I guess before his very throne. And the Bible says that's the place where we experience uh, joy and uh, pleasures forevermore. Mm -hmm. And it is a joyful place, isn't it? It is. And, um, and, and, And really the, you know, Isaiah, I think it is, talks about the, uh, the song of the redeemed. You know, and there's that. There's even a song. You know, therefore the the song of re, uh, therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And so, what is the song of the of the redeemed? You know, you ever wonder about that? Well, I, it kind of tells us. It says an everlasting joy yes. will be upon their heads. You know, that song of the redeemed is the song of joy. Because it's a song of a people whose sins have been forgiven. You know, they're no longer are they held under the judgment, the penalty, the debt of their sin. They've been completely forgiven. And so that's really the place that I come to minister uh, from. You know, I want to be able to minister from that place of joy. And, you know, when folks see me over time, they'll notice that's that's one of the components is that... um, is that I lead from that place of joy. Now, I've been through intense situations where there would be occasion not to be joyful or there would be tragedy or situations where I where in you know great sadness would be would be there. Um but my my paradigm that I come to God with is is you know even in the midst of my tragic circumstances I'm coming to the one person who has everything that I need. You know, I'm coming to the one person who has every answer, the one person that has the power to change, you know, the situation that I'm in and the the one that causes everything to work together for good in my life. And so to that one person that I'm coming to, I can come with joy because I know that I'm coming to the one who will redeem me. You know, I'm coming to my rescuer, my deliverer. And that's a joyful proposition. Yeah, I was just going to say that's something to be really joyful about, absolutely. And uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength, no matter what the circumstances we're facing. Mm -hmm. Um, Before we proceed, let's just pause for a moment so that I can remind our listeners that they are welcome to call in to talk with you, Holland. The first five callers will receive a free copy of your dynamic book, which, by the way, is a very uniquely styled book. I think it's both user-friendly and easy to read. Um, please call us at 646-378-0089, and you will receive a free copy of Let It Rise by Holland Davis, a new publication of Bridge Logos Foundation. That number, once again, is 646 378 Zero zero eight nine, and we look forward to your call. The word anointing is often mentioned in uh, from the pulpit uh, when I watch a lot of uh, ministers on television and so forth. And I suspect it has a very vital role with regard to both worship and preaching. Uh, what is your understanding of the anointing, Holland? 
Well, I I do believe that God does anoint for service, and um, you know we're told that in Acts uh, in Acts chapter one, where the Holy Spirit is poured out, or Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church, and it, there's an anointing for for um, for evangelism for service to go out and to spread uh, to preach the gospel, and um, we also see that in um, uh, I just did a study on this where talking about um a dunamis the the power you know dunamis power yeah. and literally dunamis is the power that comes upon a community it's not just individuals but upon a community and so you know in in the old testament we would see god would come upon the nation of israel to give them victory in battle and, and all those sorts of things but i think that oftentimes um you know, we in our culture um, define anointing a little bit differently than the way God defines it. And that we almost define anointing as meaning something that we like. So if we say, boy, that song is anointed, really what we're saying is, I really like that song. Or, you know, that hot dog was anointed. Or, you know, <laughs> I say Krispy Kreme donuts are anointed, you know. <laughs> it's like anything that we really like a lot that really touches our lives, you know, our hearts, you know, we'll say, wow, that was anointed. But what I see in the scriptures is that, you know, anointing, that empowering for service is something that goes way beyond the individual. It's 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 an intangible th- effect in a sense that is, uh, of God's presence, His power working through the life of an individual or a community that goes way beyond that community. For instance, the the story of uh, Dwight Moody. Um, Dwight was a was a um, was an incredible evangelist and would go out preaching. And he was in a city where these two old ladies come up to him and and they were just you know Dwight, you need the anointing you need to be filled with the holy spirit and he's like i don't you know what are you talking about and and he was you know he was already being effective as a as a, a communicator of the gospel mm-hmm. and so but this what these old ladies trouble you know troubled him and so he went back and he prayed and he prayed and 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 he and he cried out to god and and finally you know, he writes about it in, in his book where he he doesn't go into detail, but he said he had such an experience with God that he had to tell God to, to, to stay his hand lest he would perish. You know, he just he thought he was going to die, you know, because of what was happening. It was just so intense. And after that, he gave the same messages, gave the same appeals, but the effect of the ministry was multiplied much greater. Hmm. Same energy different outcome greater outcome and so i think that's what um that's what i look at when i look at the anointing is that you know you'll see different worship leaders or different pastors or communicators or teachers and they'll say the same things that someone else says but when they say it there's a a different impact versus when someone else says it yeah. and i look at that impact that that effect as as really the evidence of the anointing of God. You know, for instance, the song, you know, Let It Rise, I wish I, wish I could say, man, I, I toiled and labored over this, and it was just this incredible burst of creativity and, and, uh, and that it was, you know, truly a, you know, uh, born out of my experience and all these different things, and so I could take credit for that song. Um, but the reality of it is is that from day one that song was a you know it was a gift from God and it had an anointing a blessing from God on it and that song has gone all around the world it's gone more places than I could ever imagine to go and it has had great impact and great effect um on uh you know on people's lives more than I could ever you know do myself and so I look at that as the effect of, or the evidence of, God's anointing on something. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, to be sure. Um, by the way, if you uh, could just share with us, uh, there may be some listeners who are not familiar with the song Let It Rise. I'm not asking you to sing it, but <laughs> if you don't mind just giving us some of the words of it. 
Well, the the um, the verse goes that the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. You know, let the songs of the Lord, let the joy of the King rise among us. And it was actually recorded by Big Daddy Weave um, a couple years ago, and um, they they've done just an incredible job. But there's been so many people. Uh, William Murphy in the gospel community recorded it. Stephen Hurd also uh, recorded it and did an incredible gospel version of it. Um, Paul Balash was the first person that recorded it on a praise band record. And, um, of course, then it went on the Promise Keepers records, and it just kind of took off, went all the way around the world from there. And so, terrific. yeah, it's just, it's just, and I've heard it in Spanish, I've heard it in all kinds of different languages, and, and so it's like, you know, that's, to me, it's like, that's that's the anointing of God. It's it, it multiplies way beyond what I could ever do on my own. And with regard to the anointing that we talked about a moment ago, um, what was it, for example, that D.L. Moody did that made the difference, just his acceptance of the idea of the anointing or did he have to do something else no it it really was he simply asked and then he received it Mm -hmm. and it really is that simple it's it's so interesting within the um you know with god it's it's so basic that uh, a child can understand it you know and just like salvation we we ask and we receive um, I'm finding out God works that way in everything. And when we simply ask with that childlike faith and we receive, you know, from God and trust, you know, we just expect that he's going to do it. It's like when my kid comes up to me and says, hey, you know, can you can you take me down, you know, and get me a hamburger at McDonald's? You know, it's like, like, yeah, of course I'll do that. You know, they, they don't come to me with the expectation of, you know, dad's going to say no because he always says no, you know. Yes. They they come to me with the expectation of dad's going to say yes. I want to do this and dad's going to say yes. And um and that's why I think so often as believers when we come to God, we we do come to him with a little bit of a reservation like, you know, God, I know this is my request, but I'm not sure that you're one hearing and two if you're actually going to you know, grant it, or you're going to answer this request, and so, you know, we come with a little bit of doubt and reserve, you know, in in our approach to to God, and yet, you know, in all things, you know, the 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 disciples simply waited. They asked the Lord. You know, Jesus said, "Wait here, and I'm going to give you a gift," and 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 they were all in the upper room, and then you know, and then it happened, um, and so uh, D. L. Moody just uh, just asked. And God gave it to him. Praise the Lord. Um, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and he loves to give us the desires of our hearts. So uh, we need simply to ask him, don't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have in the book, I've noticed an acronym there that is based on the word FLOW. And I wondered if you would explain uh, the elements of that acronym for us. Well, that's talking about um, listening to one another, at least in the context of uh, of music, mm-hmm. and um, you know, because as people are in a worship uh, setting, you know, one of the things that I talk about with worship leaders is, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you uh, get your team on the same page. How do you? What do you teach them? And and this actually came out of a teaching that I taught to my own worship team. You know, on on what it meant to to kind of flow together as a team. You know, my basic theological concept is that worship is sung prayer. And so, like any prayer time that you have, um, there's always an interaction. And so. You know, it begins from the first moment the pastor prays to open up the service. You know, uh, you can have an entire set list plan, but then the minute he prays, that prayer can set the course of the of the morning, and it may be totally different than what you had planned. Yes. And so, well, learning. I hate, to, I hate to interrupt you here. We're about down to only about 24 seconds remaining of our half hour. Oh my! <laughs> this half hour 
went by extremely quickly, and it was a real joy and pleasure uh, to speak with you. And thank you so much for your practical and helpful teaching on worship that you've shared with us and that is in the book as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to buy a copy of this book as soon as you can. Uh, thank you, Holland. All right. God bless. Okay. Now I think we're no longer live. Um, I just want to thank you again, and I'm sorry I had to interrupt what you were saying at the end. That that half hour went by very quickly. <laughs> wow. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that was an anointed half hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, my brother. Thank and you. God bless you, and keep in touch with us. Uh, if there's anything we can do, uh, let us know, okay? Absolutely, I will do that. God bless you, sir. All right, take care. Bye-bye. All right, bye.